As a Christian, I believe that God exists, obviously. Um, more specifically, I believe that the God revealed in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit exists. But today I wanted to uh, talk about the question of whether or not we can prove that God exists. In other words, what I mean is, can we prove the existence of God through science, logic, or any or any other human means? Uh, when I was younger, I was obsessed with apologetics. I was always looking for a fight uh, in a sense. I was always looking to debate somebody the question of God's existence. And so I would have quickly answered yes to this question. We can emphatically prove that God exists through logic, through science, through whatever. Um, but today, I think there are a number of very important theological reasons for why we should actually say no to this question of being able to prove God exists. And so it's that insight that I want to talk about today. Um, the existence of God cannot be proven through human means. Um, and it may sound like something strange, but the insight for this, I think, best comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said it extremely well in 1931 when he wrote, a God who could be proved by us would be an idol. Now think about what he's saying here. If God could be proven by human means, then the question is, what sort of God are we proving exists? Such a God would merely be a projection of human insight up into the heavens, and thus it would not be God and God's self, but an idol we have fashioned after our own intellect. We would not be proving the God and Father of Jesus Christ most importantly, but some other God, some God argued through speculation, through logical proofs, and other sorts of uh, logical constructions, not the God of revelation. And so at the bottom, this is really what comes down to the issue when we're addressing this question theologically, which God is being proven? Uh, because just the existence of a God isn't necessarily what I'm interested in as a Christian theologian, but in the God and Father of Jesus Christ, who is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit and in the witness of Scripture. And so proving a God fashioned after our own logical intellect is not any anything that I would be interested in today. And so I want to talk about this question a little bit more. Um, and I also want to address kind of the inverse of this question. Um Bonhoeffer didn't say this in, in his original quote, but I think we can take that idea and turn it on its head and say that if a god can be disproven by us, that god would be an idol. And so both sides of that spectrum of either the dogmatic theists who believe that god can be proven through logical proofs or the dogmatic atheists who believe that they have absolute proof through science or logic or whatever that god does not exist. Both of those are two sides of the same coin, and they make the same categorical error. And so with all of this, it gives me reason to discuss um, one of the major developments of 20th century modern theology, namely the non-objectifiability of God. And so this is an insight that's central to Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, Rudolf Bultmann, uh, and even Bonhoeffer himself. And so this gives me some reason to discuss that. And so... For that point, we're going to move to our first point and discuss dialectical theology and the importance of the non-objectifiability of God and how this relates to the question of proving God's existence. Karl Barth, in his famous Romans commentary, stressed the otherness of God. He was deeply influenced by Kierkegaard's important concept of an infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity. So what does this mean? Let's break it down by each term, because each term is important for that phrase. First, what we are discussing here is a distinction, a difference between God and humanity. But this distinction is one of quality, not merely of quantity. Thus, it is not that God is simply bigger and better than humanity in a quantitative sense, but that God is qualitatively distinct from human beings in an infinite sense. And so the very fact of it being a distinction is impossible to quantify because it is an infinite qualitative distinction. There is a chasm too great to fathom between the distinction of what it is to be God and what it is to be a creature of God. And so this insight sets Bart on the trajectory to rejecting natural theology uh, with its tendency to project who God is from human beings. And a part of this is his rejection of his liberal theology um, education, uh, 
specifically Hay was interested in rejecting the easy tendency of liberal theology to align social and political movements with the act of God in history, and so particularly with the Nazi regime. This uh, helped Bart be a outspoken critic of Hitler and the Nazi uh, ideology. Um, and you can actually see this historically when you look at the army of the Nazis themselves. On their belts, you would read, God was with us. And so they had flattened this distinction between God and humanity and claimed God as their own, as a tool that they could use for their own ideological endeavors. And so thus, Bart began to stress the non-objectifiability of God, that God cannot become an object for human speculation or control. He stressed the holy otherness of God. So we speak of God only because God has spoken of God's self. That is, because God has revealed God's self in the person of Jesus Christ. And that further explains Bart's Christocentric thought. We cannot arrive at the knowledge of God through speculation, through beginning with human beings and amplifying our concept of what it is to be a human being, what it is to be good, to the nth degree, and then say that that's what God is like. Uh, we must do the opposite approach and begin with where God has actually revealed God's self and God's nature. And so we can see a similar impulse in the thought of Paul Tillich, who once famously said this, God does not exist. He is being itself beyond essence and existence. Therefore, to argue that God exists is to deny him. And so the logic for this is that we cannot place God upon the same plane of existence as all other forms of being, specifically as in the same form of created being. The creator is infinitely, qualitatively distinct from the creature. And so God is beyond existence itself, beyond being. Um, and so the logic behind this is that non-objectifiability of God, that God cannot become an object that takes takes uh, ownership, that human beings can take ownership over within the creaturely sphere. Thus, these two examples go to show that Bonhoeffer's quote about proving God's existence is actually rooted in dialectical theology. It is based upon this concept of the non-objectifiability of God, upon the infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity, uh, which ultimately aims at protecting the livingness of God and, turning, and keeping God from turning into an idol that we fashion after ourselves. And so that goes a long way in explaining why Bonhoeffer said that a God who could be proven by us would be an idol. Karl Barth once said that we cannot speak of God by speaking of man with a loud voice. The point here is that God is not merely a projection of what we think is good and holy and righteous and perfect amplified up to the nth degree. We cannot begin on this plane of existence with the assumption that God exists on the same plane of being. We have to keep in mind that infinite qualitative distinction. But what tends to happen in our doctrine of God is that we take uh, proper concepts of goodness and love and justice and we amplify them to the nth degree and we call it God. But Barr emphasized that this approach is severely problematic and leads to the creation of an idol, after a God after our own image. And so instead, we know God according to divine revelation, where God has spoken of God's self. So that is why any attempt to prove God through human-centric logic inevitably results in the creation of an idol because it is the projection of our nature and our insights up into the divine being. And so it necessarily creates a mechanism of idolatry. It creates the mechanism of projecting who, what it is to be human as what it is to be divine. Because by definition, in order to argue logically from the human point of view, from, the, from a human construction, is to create human tools of fashioning God. And ultimately, it would not be the God and Father of Jesus Christ whom we have proven through these logical um, proofs and logical explanations. And so the attempt to prove God through logic, through science, through any sort of abstract construction is a false start. It is an attempt to prove another God, an attempt to prove an idol.
The God and Father of Jesus Christ, whom we profess to believe, is not proven by human hands, but can only be proven and believed through God and God's self, through the Holy Spirit and the witness of revelation. And so it is the opposite order of things. We cannot move from the human logic up into God, but God can come to us. And that's exactly what took place in the incarnation. The revelation of God, God's speaking of God's self to human beings um, in the uh, person and work of Jesus Christ, uh, witnessed to by the Holy Spirit and by the witness of Scripture. And so... The implications of this are many. Obviously, the apologetic sphere doesn't necessarily need to be done away with. There's a benefit to certain aspects of apologetics. I'm not trying to say that apologetics is completely bankrupt, but the naivety of apologetics that begins with the assumption that on the same scientific and logical humanistic footing, we can prove God is simply a false start. Uh, it's a um, leading down the wrong path. And so... On the other side of the spectrum, though, the naive scientism and the dogmatic atheism that tends to assert that God absolutely is disproven is just as bankrupt in its thinking. Um, this uh, fundamentalist tendency in both schools of thought is the exact same, the exact same tendency, and so. They are really two sides of the same coin. Those who claim that dogmatically they can prove uh, beyond reasonable doubt through logic or science that God exists. Uh, and on the other side, those who dogmatically and fundamentally prove that they God does not exist are really two sides of the exact same coin. And so um, both sides of that spectrum um, make this categorical error where they assume this distinction between God and humanity does not exist, that the human logic can somehow make that leap between the infinite qualitative distinction, but we know that that cannot take place, uh, that such a leap is impossible for human beings to make only through revelation, through God making the leap, God's self, into the human sphere, can we know God. Um, that's actually what Jesus talks about in the scriptures, where he says, no one knows the Father but the Son, and whom the Son chooses to reveal. And so the C. Baxter Kruger once said it, that revelation is a closed circle. It's God's knowledge of God's self that we are then invited to participate in. Um, and so that kind of reflects back to Bart's point of why he often stressed the inseparability of revelation and reconciliation. In other words, that we cannot know God until we've actually been reconciled to God. These are not two separate events of the Christian faith. We don't first logically accept that God exists and then are saved through Christ. It has to be one event where revelation and reconciliation take place as one because they're both works of grace, they're both works of the Holy Spirit, and they're both works of God acting in us. Thus, um, Ernst Bloch once famously said that only an atheist can be a good Christian. And Jürgen Maltman cleverly reversed that around, and he said that only a Christian can be a good atheist. Because what it means to be a Christian is to deny the existence of idols, to be against all forms of idolatry, and then to do so for the sake of God, for the sake of the true God, beyond all of the idolatrous attempts to prove God uh, from a human-centric logic. Anything fashioned after human hands uh, is an idol. And so, God must be known according to God's self in the event of divine revelation. And so, what does this mean for personal faith? Does it mean that we can't believe that God exists? Certainly not. Um, as I began in this uh, video, I believe that God exists as a Christian. For me, the nature of faith is not identical with certainty. It is not dogmatic agreement with a set of presuppositions or um, dogmas or uh, beliefs. Faith is much more nuanced than just saying yes or no to an idea. It is trust in the midst of struggle. Uh, faith is wrestling with God. It is a tension between belief and unbelief. It is not certainty. And thus, faith is not the absence of doubt nor is doubt the absence of faith. Actually, I would argue that both faith and doubt need each other. They exist in a dialectical relationship. And thus, true faith necessarily includes doubt, and true doubt does not exclude faith. For a Christian, faith is a gift 
given by grace. It is not a work we perform, but a reality we experience by the power of the Holy Spirit awakening faith within us. And so it's not a work we perform that we can either logically um, work ourselves into or logically work ourselves out of. One of my favorite definitions of theology is that it is faith seeking understanding. As St. Anselm writes, For I do not seek to understand so that I may believe, have faith, but I believe so that I may understand. In other words, he reverses the relationship that we typically think of in the Western logical uh, environment, where we typically assume that we first have to understand and then believe. He says, no, we do not understand and then believe. We believe and then we work to understand that belief. We have the experience of faith. We have the phenomenon of faith where God has met us by the Spirit. And then we seek to understand the nature of that faith. Um, And so this is a top-down approach to faith instead of a bottom-up. Faith is not something we generate within ourselves, but the gift of grace. Um, And so... The tendency to separate knowledge from experience is uh, incompatible with the Christian faith in this sense. And this goes back to what we were talking about with Bart and Revelation and Reconciliation. Um, To know God at all means, in the Christian sense, to enter into a saving relationship with God. Thus, we cannot prove that God exists outside of the reconciling work of God and salvation. To attempt to do so, according to Bart, according to Bonhoeffer, according to Tillich, is to attempt to prove an idol. It is actually to deny the Christian faith, to deny God. Now, of course, there can be so much more that we might say about this subject. Um, It's a vast subject. Faith itself is a massive question. Uh, What it is, what it looks like to live out faith. Um, The question between faith and doubt is a big question as well. Um, But I hope this brief uh, video has introduced you to a few potentially new ideas around this question, uh, particularly around Bonhoeffer's quote, which I think is a really great quote for kind of dipping your toe into this um, new approach to what it is to know God. Um, And so in my book on Samuel Beckett, I write about this um, to some extent. Um, Writing about Beckett gave me the opportunity to study a figure who lived in the gray areas of faith. He did not claim faith. He didn't claim unfaith either. He wouldn't call himself a theist or an atheist or even an agnostic. Um, He was most aptly called a God-haunted man. Um, And so his literature is considered bleak and often blasphemous, but I found a tremendous religious uh, sensibility within his work. And so in study, studying that sensibility in my, in my latest book, it's called Christ's Wait for Godot. Um, it gave me the opportunity to dive into these questions a bit more. So it's been on my mind since the book, and I figured I'd put the question out here uh, and kind of discuss it more. So if you're interested in it, uh, you may enjoy my book on Beckett, because um, it does, as much as the main focus is to study the literature of Samuel Beckett, um, I also have many reasons to discuss these questions of faith and what it is like to live not in this fundamentalist certainty that's false and superficial, but to live in those gray areas that are often a little bit messier and a little bit more beautiful, to be honest. And um, I also would recommend Tillich's book called Dynamics of Faith. I'll put a link in the description. Um, it's a really good sub- book on the subject of faith and what it is to have faith and particularly that question of faith and doubt. And so for now, I um, would like to hear what you think about all of this. Were you someone like me that used to love apologetics, used to work through all the logical arguments to prove that God exists, uh, rehearse them and practice them with people? Um, Or are you somebody that maybe never understood apologetics? Um, And maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you think Bonhoeffer is wrong, that to prove God does not necessarily mean to prove an idol, that there's still a place for such logical uh, attempts to prove God. Um, And ultimately, do you think that this approach is helpful to the modern world? So let me know in a comment below. Love to hear from you. But uh, for now, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.